Hi, my name's Bob Grinier and I'm a volunteer with the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project. It gives me absolute pleasure to give this presentation to you today and it is part of a series on the magnetic signature of strange radiation and this is part four and I'm calling it right now, Do You Want To Be Lucky? Now, there are some prerequisites, so if you haven't really watched these, then I suggest you go and watch them first, and that will make it very easy to understand this short presentation. And these are a number of videos that I produced over the last uh, several weeks prior to making this one. Why did our field not get it in 1995? Uh, principally looking at the work of uh, Matsumoto, uh, Takaaki Matsumoto. And then a whole series of presentations on uh, unusual strange radiation uh, and the magnetic and kinetic nature of that radiation, uh, which we are going to uh, bring to an important point and juncture in this presentation. Now, before I go into that, I want to ask the question, what earns a Nobel Prize in Physics? Well, if you go to the site, and I'll do that in a second, just for a quick look-see, um, typically a discovery of a new particle, or discovery of properties of a particle, discovery of useful detection methods for a particle, or advancement uh, in the understanding of the cosmos, for instance. So if I take you to the Nobel Prize site here for physics, and I type in, let's say, neutrino, and it's found six matches here. So the most recent one was uh, for uh, uh, Takaki Kajita and Arthur B. MacDonald for the discovery of neutrino oscillations, which shows that neutrinos have mass. And uh, that's very, very important for what we're talking about. Um, so that was very recently. In 2002, uh, there was... Uh, Raymond Davis Jr. and uh, Masatoshi Koshiba for pioneering contributions to astrophysics, uh, in particular for the de detection of cosmic neutrinos. Of course, uh, Alexander Parkamov in his book Space, Space Earth Human had uh, been observing cosmic neutrons, since, uh, neutrinos rather, since the late uh, 1980s. Um, however, that book wasn't published in Russian until 2009, but he had published book, uh, pa other papers earlier on that work. Um, in 1995, Frederick Reines uh, was given half a um, prize for physics for the detection of the neutrino, and uh, that was actually done in the late 1950s. Uh, and we have here... Uh, Liedemann, Schwartz and Steinberger for the neutrino beam method and demonstration of the doublet structure of the leptons through discovery of muon neutrino. So there we go, there's, there's a neutrino. Now let's have a look at particle. So I'm looking here at particle now. And of course the very famous uh, Engelert and Higgs for uh, the Higgs boson. They both proposed it, I, I believe it was, uh, for theoretical discovery of the mechanism that contributes to our understanding of the origin of mass of subatomic particles. Um, then this one, 1992, for his invention and development of particle detectors. So there we go, we have a... Um, a Particle Detection Nobel Prize in 1992. Uh, in uh, 1990, we have uh, Friedman, Kendall and Taylor for their pioneering uh, investigations concerning deep inelastic scattering of electrons on protons and bound neutrons, which have been essential uh, importance for development of the quark model in physics. Here we have in 1984, Rubia and Demir, for their decisive contributions to the large project, which led to the discovery of field particles, uh, W and Z, uh, communicators of weak interaction. So here we have something that is important for weak interaction, and uh, uh, they get a Nobel Prize for that. Here we have in 1979, Sheldon Lee Glashow and Salam and Weinberg for their contributions to the theory of unified weak and electromagnetic interaction between elementary particles. So here we are talking about 
interaction of, of weak and uh, electromagnetic uh, interaction particles. Very interesting. Uh, in 1976, Richter and Chung Ting for their pioneering work in the discovery of heavy elementary particles of a new kind. Hmm, interesting. Uh, Bohr in uh, uh, Mottelson and Rainwater in 1975 for the discovery of connection between uh, collective motion and particle motion in atomic nuclei. Uh, go down here, we've got uh, Jell Mann for his contributions in 1969. He got the award and discoveries concerning classification of elementary particles and their interactions. Uh, Nobel Prize uh, for Physics in 1968. Uh, Alvarez for his decisive contributions to elementary particle physics. Uh, here we have in 1965, uh, Tomon Tomonaga, Schwinger and Feynman for their fundamental work in quantum electrodynamics with deep plowing consequences for physics of elementary particles. Uh, there we go, in 1963, Wigner for his contribution to the theory of atomic nucleus and elementary particles. Down here, uh, Yang and Li for their pe uh, penetrating investigation of the so-called parity laws, which has led to the important discoveries regarding elementary particles in 1957, 1951. Cockcroft and Walton for their pioneering work on the transmutation of atomic nuclei. This is the proton uh, uh, lithium interaction to the seven lithium to produce two four helium via beryllium eight. Um, uh, and that's the first sort of fusion fission reaction there. So that's actually for showing that uh, you can have a process by which you can both uh, we can have a transmutation and it's a, a nuclear process and that actually proved that it was possible uh, obviously they did that earlier i think in 1932 but um, this is 1951 when they got the award and we go down here all the way down to charles thomas reese wilson wilson uh, uh, for his method of making the paths of electrically charged particles visible by condensation of vapor. And this is the chap. So in 1927, he got the uh, uh, prize, uh, Nobel Prize for Physics, for showing a method by which you can um, observe uh, the motion or um, the fact that you have uh, particles and allowing you to study them. So in the context of that, I want to continue with this presentation. So the nature of unusual radiation in Lena, uh, sometimes called strange radiation or exotic vacuum objects, there are other names as well. Um, it's able to pass through metals, glass, ceramics and plastic, etc. If it's in a uh, neutral state, uh, it's able to live in metals for days, as observed by Bogdanovich and by Matsumoto. Months, as observed by Lyon and uh, Baranoff and Zatalepin, and even years in those cases as well. And also, um, Shoulders said they can live in metals indefinitely. So um, that was a statement made a long time ago. Not just, just standard neutron, proton, alpha, photon or electrons. Um, there's something much more interesting going on. And uh, whilst it may sometimes masquerade as some of these things uh, and be detected, it isn't really those things. Uh, they are also sort of byproducts of the action of strange radiation, it would seem, for the most part. It promotes beta decay, uh, so it looks like it has uh, a role in the weak process um, or, or act activates or, or can, can perform the weak process and isotope balancing. So it takes like a heavy nucleon and uh, a light nucleon and it spits out a, a bunch of uh, sort of mid-range between them nucleons. And we discussed that in one of the previous presentations with the work of, of Reutzkev with exploding uh, foils uh, uh, where he observed a different spectrum of isotopes synthesized dependent on the elements that were going in. And it can be produced in many ways. Uh, these were uh, established uh, by Oroitskev, uh, Bogdanovich, uh, many, many authors, uh, uh, and all the team at, uh, uh, by Shishkin and uh, obviously Matsumoto. Many, many, any, almost anyone in Lena has observed that by, by cavitation and so forth. And it has a magnetic and kinetic moment. And that is what I'm going to draw your attention to again today. Now, I shared this uh, video here, and I'm going to press play now. 
just leave it playing there in the background. I'm going to kill the audio. Um, but essentially, uh, it wasn't clear at the time what, what, what was what in this image. And uh, this is an experiment with a rotating nickel plate with magnets uh, 20 centimeters from the generator. Now I have to go back to the beginning, but essentially um, uh, this was done by Baranoff and Zatalepin, and uh, I have uh, worked with them to understand it so that I can share that with you. And at the back here, in this area here, this is a nickel hydrogen reactor. This whole thing is a calorimeter. And this is the door of the calorimeter that would ordinarily be shut. And so this is to very accurately measure the heat output uh, comparison to the electrical input. This area here is the back wall of the calorimeter. And what this is here is a bag full of wax. And uh, over here is the torsion balance. And you can see a thread that's suspending it and threads going over something and coming down and being held over here. Now, the reason this wax was here was at the time the video was made, it was believed that the wax block could protect against unknown, which he likes to call it unknown radiation, another name for strange radiation, emitted by the reactor. Because they found that it it, it was emitted all over the laboratory, something that was observed by David Hudson. If you go and uh, look at the video uh, disappearing uh, tungsten, it was observed by David Hudson and also uh, by um, Leclerc in his cavitation experiments. So, uh, and, and, and several other authors as well. So basically, um, they were concerned because of the, the death of Yuji Bajatov, and uh, they suspected that exposure to strange radiation may have played a role in that. And so uh, they wanted to find a way to shield from this, and they suspected that maybe it can be moderated because it's, it's neutron-like, like sometimes it can appear neutron-like in that it, can, uh, it doesn't appear to have uh, charge in certain states. Uh, perhaps it could be moderated, I guess, by by uh, wax, um, potentially. But uh, anyway, that was where they were when they were doing this. Uh, and I asked him for more clarification. And so he sent me this image here. And this is on his desk, and he's laid things out as it's actually in this uh, arrangement, pretty much. Um, but on a desk so you can see it. Now, um, he has here uh, an improved torsion balance. And this is improved because he has these small little uh, uh, neodymium magnets and uh, the disc suspension me mechanism is better. Now, it looks like it's a, it's a plastic disc or maybe a mica disc, I don't know. But anyway, uh, there's a disc and then he has the metal bent around and then what he said was uh, it's uh, opposite uh, poles. So you have a north opposite a north and a south opposite a south. So effectively it goes north, south, north, south as you read around it. Uh, you can see here that the, um, the uh, wax blocks are, I guess, uh, uh, five, six, seven, eight, something like that uh, centimeters thick. Here is the nickel hydrogen reactor. Now, the specifications of the hyd nickel hydrogen reactor are that it has two concentric tubes. That's one within inside the other. The outer one that you see here is four centimeters in diameter. Then it has a one centimeter inner. And then they have tungsten wound around the outside. And this is important because tungsten obviously can uh, go to very high temperatures. Um, and so that was used to heat uh, the uh, inner, inner contents with uh, electrical current. And then inside the small one centimeter uh, inner diameter tube, there was approximately 10 grams, I guess, of prepared uh, 10 micron nickel powder. And then th I don't think that's actually sealed because it's harder to seal the hot tube, as it were. Uh, they fill the outer tube, which they seal uh, with hydrogen, and the overall length here is 30 centimeters. So this was supplied by Valeri Zatalepin, and that's the overall layout of the detector. Now, why would you think it has north, north, south, south? Well, first off, uh, Zhigalov and Parkamov ascertained that the radiation from their particular type of reactor 
uh, was only really observed up to around about 20 centimeters away. So if you go from the center of this reactor and go out to 20 centimeters, it's here. It's just outside the uh, the, the fulcrum, the, the support of the torsion balance. So, uh, and also in line, uh, if you took a line across there, it's kind of outside, um, its, its range would not meet these ones. So whether that's critical, I don't know, but it's just a point I thought would be worth making at, at this stage. Now, I sh this was one of the videos in the uh, magnetic signature of strange radiation. And uh, there's a link to the video here. And this was uh, work done and then published in 2002 by Reutzkev et al. And the video here was where he wanted to see if there was a monopole nature to this radiation because several authors had suggested that it could be. And uh, he used the uh, a pure or nearly pure piece of iron 57, two pieces of it, 90 degrees apart, some distance away in, in the tens of centimeters, I believe it was from, from my recollection. Um, and he had on, on the back side of one, the north pole of a magnet, and the back side of the other, the south pole of the magnet. And the idea was that the, the north uh, monopole would come into the south uh, pole of that uh, piece of uh, uh, iron 57 and, and vice versa. And in fact, he found that was the case. And that affected the NMR response of the 57 iron when it was analysed later. So uh, this helps you to understand how this device works. And I'm just going to explore it a little here. So what we have here is I have uh, some uh, similar mag size magnets to that. They're, they're just cubes, but I've correctly put the pole on there. And if I use <clears throat> MagnaView paper, and this is like a, it's like a plastic film with a, I think it's a zinc compound in there, but something anyway. Um, it, it orients itself so that it produces a dark area where the uh, pole, or either north or south, is coming directly out of the uh, magnet. So if I press play here, you can see that that image is what appears when you overlay the MagnaView paper. Now, the same is the case with these larger uh, neodymiums, which I've got much closer together. Now, you can imagine that if we had uh, a, a much more sensitive way of representing the magnetic field here, it, here, it would end up looking like this, uh, where you have like a, a dead zone here and, and, and a field switchover between the north and south. Now, I believe that is important when we actually look at the torsion balance. Now, if I am uh, to suggest that the core of the strange radiation, the unusual radiation, uh, is the exotic vacuum object structure here, which I derived from looking at John Hutchison samples, and the videos uh, for that are here, um, it works, uh, in my view, uh, quite a lot like a normal Lord Kelvin smoke ring vortex, uh, in that it's only effectively rotating here. There's no real rotation here in, in the macro sense, but the fractal subclusters, of which this is just three layers, but you can imagine that one of the small ones of these is exactly the same as the big one, and, and any small ones on that small one would be the same as the big one in terms of layers. And, you know, it could go down and go down and go down. And because the the microfine structure is able to move things, you end up by having things ro ro rotating around that way and traveling around this way. And the combination of the effect m m means you've got a, both a, a toroidal and a poloidal uh, vortex going on. Now, um, I shared that on the 17th of February, uh, 2020. So to create your, uh, your monopoles, um, your uh, north would need, require the, the 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 toroidal to be rotating that way, and your south would be requiring the toroidal uh, part component to be rotating that way. But like I say, the actual segments themselves don't move. It's the substructures of the substructures of the substructures, blah 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 blah, that it, that are doing the moving, and that influences the matter and the the electrons, so the other uh, condensed matter, and so. Uh, if you imagine that uh, you have your uh, reactor here and it's outputting this flux of strange radiation, uh, it's it's not able to... So the, the wax would uh, essentially uh, help to protect any thermal effects. The level of this is below the height of this and it's kind of hi hidden behind uh, the wax. So 
Um, it's it's not uh, really a conve convection thing going on. And you would know uh, when the strange radiation is being produced and when it's not being produced, because when it's not being produced, this wouldn't turn. But essentially, if you had a north pole coming out, it would connect uh, onto the south pole, and the the uh, south poles would connect onto the north pole. And why is that relevant? Was well, because um, <laughs> effectively, if if a, a north uh, sorry south pole is coming out here, would come down here, and its its uh, torsional component would be one way. And the, the, the opposite would be true because on this north pole on the top, there would be a south pole. And so a north would then come underneath. And so um, basically your south goes on top and your north goes on the bottom. But they're effectively their rotations are both the same way around. So this would go up like that and rotate and spin that way. And this one still spin that way. So the, the net result is it doesn't matter... Um, uh, whether it's a north or a south coming in, they would align themselves very readily with the poles of the magnet and transfer the torsional moment, which we've seen very, very clearly on uh, lion quartz, where you have two structures and it's kind of shifting material off and then it gets to the boundary between two of the exotic vacuum objects and it shifts it off again. So you can see that it's actually moving the material or it's at least moving the electrons. Um, and so it has this t torsional moment. And of course, it's also got its kinetic moment. So uh, and that's able to allow it to get to the um, uh, the actual sensor, the torsion balance. And because it's magnetic, because it's magnetic, it can connect to that. So that leads you to the conclusion. And this led Valery Zatalepin, who in this video on the 5th of October was telling Alexander Parkhamov, I recorded this video, and he was saying, you need to put some um, insulator on the outside of your calorimeter because you are wasting your strange radiation. Well, that all changed because of this torsional balance. And it says, it has been found that the best protection against unknown radiation is a metal wall made of ferromagnetic material. Metal. Uh, we uh, currently use such a torsion balance to detect the generation of unknown radiation in other types of reactors. Valeri Zetalepin. Wow, wow, wow. This is an important moment in Lena history because we have a detector, not for the neutrons that might just about be high enough energy uh, from whatever you think it is, ultra low um, momentum of neutrons, whether, you, whether you're talking about one theory or the other, it doesn't matter. Um, only a few will get out. We saw some in, in, in GS 5.3. Um, uh, you know, uh, X-rays and, and gamma rays, these have been seen or seem to be seen. We saw something like that in GS 5.2, but as Takaki Matsumoto said in 1995, this isn't what it is. What you are seeing is an electromagnetic pulse, uh, which we know comes out of these things when they blow up. Um, and so you're fooled into thinking you're seeing neutrons, you're fooled into thinking you're seeing uh, um, uh, uh, photons uh, of ver various energies. Uh, we know that they can output betas and so forth, but it's sometimes secondary interactions with materials through the weak force that allows uh, you to detect things when it's not actually the, the, the actual radiation itself. So, uh, this leads me to say, an, uh, to give an example of what did not stop them. Now, one of the presentations I gave as a prerequisite is this one. This is from uh, 2012 and it is by Ed Storms and uh, Brian Scanlan at Kiva Labs. But uh, they found that the sample, when in an aluminium cell with glass in a copper cup with a steel wall, uh, did not stop this radiation. But they did suspect, after all of their investigations, that it had to have been the mica window. And I... Uh, believe that it was not just the role of the potassium, it was the potassium and fluorine in that mica, mica window, and I give that in this video here. But essentially, all of these materials in this reactor uh, setup here was not able to stop this unusual, this strange radiation, these oxygen vacuum objects. Many researchers have used glass, non ferromagnetic ceramics, or stainless. We have been guilty of that. And the net result is. We're not stopping the radiation. And what, what uh, Zatelepin is saying here is you're actually wasting strange radiation. Your energy that's being generated is being lost 
A lot of it is being lost, and also the ability of these things to interact and produce secondary uh, energy gains is being lost. So this is a first example of what did not stop them. There are others, but I've just given one here for, for the sake of argument. Now, an example of what may have stopped them is Andrea Rossi's original ECAT heat exchanger. And this was taken uh, in uh, uh, Bologna on the 6th of October uh, by Mats Lewin in 2011. And as you can see, there is this highly corroded... Uh, internal heat exchanger. Now, could this be aluminium? It may be. It's got good thermal conductivity, so suspect, sus suspect it may be. Um, but if it's not, it's iron uh, or some other thing. But the outside, um, I believe, is iron. And so it is no surprise to me that the, there was no detected radiation outside of the reactor, given this uh, context of this heat exchanger. So it is possible. However, uh, this is where it may have happened. I'm pretty certain that in this case, the experiments that I witnessed by Alexander Parkamov on 27th of February 2015 in Moscow, the type that showed his first successful uh, nickel-hydrogen type experiments, um, I believe that this did stop them. And the reason is the materials he used. Now, at the time, he got a lot of... Uh, um, uh, mockery and and challenges for the standard of his, of his experimentation but i believe that the materials he used were absolutely critical to him having those encouraging ex initial signs of excess heat now i want to show you the next slide here which is from this video which you can go and look at or oh, sorry this video this video is about how you use indium foil indium foil needs to be quite thick um, and a fairly large scale in order for you to to gather enough uh, neutron activations for it to work. And this video explains exactly the correct process to use for um, uh, measuring neutrons in this way. But what you have is you have indium foil used for looking for neutrons. You also have a classic U uh, 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 USSR uh, uh, military issue neutron dosimeter down here. These are both not electric means of detections of neutrons. Now there is groups out there that are using pretty much all electric me uh, methods and obviously plastics we know are damaged by strange radiation um, but pretty much all electric which we ha already know and have well documented and even experienced ourselves can be fooled by strange radiation um, so I like the fact that he used these he didn't observe neutrons and then on the top he has a pancake detector to look for gamma emissions now uh, you would have expected him to potentially see uh, strange radiation uh, emitted betas or x-rays potentially uh, in there. But why didn't he? Well, I'll tell you why he didn't. Because the top is made of iron. This is an enameled pot. If you look at the inside of the reactor, you have this aluminium heat shield here, which is reflecting some of the heat back, making it more efficient. But you have an enamel pot. You can even see the iron here, this cast iron, with the enameling over it. Then you have water, and then you have another enameled pot. So there was no way this strange radiation was getting out of all of this iron there. And the other thing about it is that the enamel contains boron, which looks like it is Lena active uh, in many different examples. Certainly our experience with our first replication, successful replication of using borosilicate glass with um, uh, Chalani uh, would point to the fact that it's, it's possible. And there we have potassium again, which seems to be the key uh, uh, potassium 40 to kind of re-energize evos if they are coming out they're neutral then if it hits here it's going to have potassium and then it has other lena active elements in there so the fact that he saw uh, apparent excess heat in this water boil off here and in the water that's boiled off from the top here uh, is not a surprise to me now because everything seems to make sense it's all logical it's all following the same argument and uh, it, kind of makes sense why Rossi may have seen excess heat. It absolutely makes sense why no excess heat is seen here. And in other people's uh, steel uh, uh, and glass and and uh, uh, other materials like, like uh, ceramics where it's not able to stop the strange radiation. Okay, so how will this help people work in Lena? Well, firstly, 
I believe this knowledge, and I, I will extend it in future presentations, but this will help people research and live safely because it has been shown that strange radiation is emitted from fast rotating bodies. That includes things like pumps and fans, you know, depending on the speed. There are things that we need to consider, um, environmental con uh, things that we need to consider. It will help us to understand what parameters produce the active agents. I cannot stress this enough. I mean, and then what materials can stop it? Ferromagnetic, such as iron, cobalt, nickel, and gadolinium. Materials with high neutron interaction, lithium, boron, cadmium, indium, gadolinium. Thicknesses, charged or grounded. So do you need to ground your uh, evos because they will build up in the metal and end up with things rusting ridiculously um, because you know, they will, whilst they're being caught by the iron, they will start to make a magnetic charge on there and they will start to degrade the iron. There's, there's no two ways about it. And so you might want to bleed them. And I've talked about this and how to protect yourself, uh, your reactors from, from uh, strange radiation. And then what parameters increase the intensity of the flux, like what temperature, what pressure, um, what, what sort of cycling is important. And then what elements to enhance the strength of the active agents. Uh, high, I'm suggesting here for the first time, and these are going to be included uh, in the Parkamov reaction tables. I'm working with Philip Power on that now. But high nuclear magnetic resonance active isotopes, such as protons and 19 fluorine. I believe that what we observed in Japan with 19 fluorine was very, very important. And the extra data that I have on that 19 fluorine uh, carbon, which also has carbon 13, which has got a high NMR active nature to it, uh, that could have been very important in what was observed. And there's a lot more data to share on that. And then um, uh, how to, uh, you know, activate the, the exotic vacuum objects. And beta isotopes, like principally uh, carbon-14 and, and things like uh, um, uh, potassium-40, these could uh, enhance their action. So, given all of the above, I want to ask you now, why would this, why would this not earn a Nobel Prize for Physics? It ticks several of the boxes that other Nobel Prize winners, you know, have uh, uh, won their prizes for. I mean, <laughs> by putting your material in between here, you're going to know whether it is able to shield for the radiation or not. By learning how fast this spins up and what when it spins, you will know which parameters and uh, materials in your reactor and treatments of your, your material are going to make it more or less Lena active. And if you don't have a shield here and you put other materials here, you will be able to know which materials are capturing the uh, strange radiation and then producing heat or transmutation um, that is beneficial uh, without actually emitting the strange radiation. It's, it's, it's so amazing. It's so simple. In its real Lena, it's a thing for Lena. Like I say, sometimes just using things out of your kitchen, not, not extremely expensive stainless steelware and, 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 and fancy whatsoever's. Sometimes you just get better results by just trying to experiment. It's the amazing thing that the Lion author has done. It's such beautiful, real data from just experimenting and following his gut feeling. This is amazing. This is amazing. What has been achieved by Baranoff and Zatalepin in this simple thing, which I don't know why it took so long when it was already published in 2002 that the strange radiation will attach to ferromagnetic material and it, the process is enhanced by the polar nature of neodymium magnets. I mean, I don't know why it took so long. So in summary, please help make Lena happen because I want us all to be lucky. I, don't, I want us all to not suffer the radiation that it emits to do this work risk-free. And I also want to be able to use this technology 
to be able to remove radioactive isotopes uh, from accidents and from the normal nuclear fission process that exists in the the world and also even from the environment from for instance in just normal uh, radon gas you know you can come up with technologies that will improve the lives of people the world over and so i got to end again why why would this not earn a nobel prize for physics thank you and i will see you in the next video